Hello and welcome to something a little different in the world of Flutzes and Waxels. It's just Alicia today, bringing you the first in a series of videos specifically to help out you Ice Dance fans. I'll be bringing you some information that may be new to you, but can help you learn to love, appreciate, and judge Ice Dance a little bit better. Up first, we're going to be talking about paper patterns. A note before we begin, I've done my best to provide thorough information to you all, but this is not an exhaustive explanation. There are more nuances to patterns and the information they convey, but for a skating fan looking to understand the patterns before the start of the season, this should be plenty. So what is a paper pattern? Paper patterns are the drawn or written out versions of the patterns you know and love. They describe the way the pattern should be skated, both in terms of what steps and turns should be used and the way they should cover the ice. The man and the lady both have paper patterns when their steps are different, which is the case with just about all the patterns we see at the competitive level. These patterns are particularly helpful for coaches who need to have a wide variety of patterns memorized for both themselves and their students. But as a skating fan, they can be helpful in your watching journey if you know what to do with them. So what do they look like? These patterns show a basic rink outline with both midlines, the short and the long, marked to help skaters identify where they should be on the ice for any given step. Each step is marked with both a line and a series of letters to identify it. Plus two different numbers, sometimes more, but we'll get into that. Typically, the key points used in the current iteration of Ice Dance in the IJS is not indicated on the pattern, but the ISU gives you all the information you need to identify and highlight, if necessary, these steps on your pattern. So how can this help you as a fan? Paper patterns certainly aren't necessary for you to understand how a pattern should look when it's skated, and it definitely isn't needed to help you enjoy watching a pattern. But if you want to understand how they're judged and get better at judging patterns in detail for yourself, they can be a useful tool. It also makes it more clear which steps are included in the key points if you only read the ISU communications and don't watch the videos released by the ISU which describe the explanations of each pattern and their key points. The only problem will be if you aren't able to identify steps and turns. Obviously, knowing what steps you should be seeing is only helpful to you if you know what they should look like on the ice. The pattern has a basic drawing of each edge and turn, which provides some insight, but it isn't going to be the biggest practical help. The good news is there's tons of resources online for you to start learning how to identify steps and turns. So how do I actually read it? There is no shortage of information on the patterns, and to get a full sense of what you'll see on the ice, you'll need to take into account each element. That said, obviously the most complex thing you'll need to decipher are the notations for each step and turn. The most common step descriptors tell you which foot, edge, and direction you're skating. These three letter notations are the foundation of every pattern. Knowing you should be doing a three turn isn't exactly helpful if you don't know which one you should be doing. These abbreviations start with either R or L for right or left followed by F or B for forwards or backwards, and then end with either I or O for the inside or outside edge. This looks like R, B, O, L, F, I, etc. The simplest dances, like the Dutch Waltz and the Canasta Tango, are primarily made up of these abbreviations. As we start to add in turns and more variants and steps, we add more abbreviations to the beginning or the end of these basic abbreviations. Let's start with the steps you're likely to see before we move on to the common turns in ice dance. The first ones you'll see in basic patterns are progressives, also known as runs, which is essentially a single cross cut, starting with the first push, the cross itself, and the step after. They're sometimes also skated as just three forward pushes, but that's primarily done with young kids. A progressive is marked on the middle step, the one with the cross cut using a PR combined with the edge notation. Progressives are the foundation of a lot of ice dance. They allow skaters to build speed effectively and act as a transition step. You'll see these in just about every single pattern. Generally, the more of these you see, the easier the pattern is. Chausses are very similar to progressives, but rather than a cross cut on the middle step, skaters lift their free leg up the ankle of their skating leg. Like progressives, it is used as a transition step most commonly in the low level tangos, as they're usually done sharply. These steps are marked with a CH attached to the edge notation. You'll also see steps called swing rolls, which are a transition step used very commonly at the low levels of ice dance. Swing rolls are abbreviated as SW 
are. A swing roll is a long step on one continuous edge where the free leg swings through from the end of the push through the opposite direction. These can be done both forwards and backwards and are most often done on an outside edge. The next most common addition to these abbreviations you'll see is the letter X, which is followed by a second letter, typically a B or an F. X's, as you might be able to guess, are crosses. And the second letter tells you what kind of cross it is, whether the foot is crossed behind with a B or in front with an F. These are all attached to the stroking abbreviations, which let you know which edge you should be on at the start of the cross. Next up are cross rolls, which are typically labeled as CR. The ISU uses CR, but some other organizations that produce patterns may use XR, just to confuse you. Cross rolls are similar to swing rolls, but rather than beginning with a simple push, they start with a cross in front, changing edge before the foot swings through. They can also be done backwards with the foot crossing behind. Changes of edge are used on long edges and add to the level of difficulty in some of those low level patterns and can help to build and maintain speed in more difficult sections of higher level patterns. They are noted by adding the second edge to the otherwise standard abbreviation for the edge. For example, this edge change in the starlight waltz is noted as R B O I. Then we move into some of the less common steps, slides, slip steps, and hops. Slides or slide chasses are used mostly in those lower level tangos like the canasta and the fiesta. They are noted as SLCH following the edge abbreviation. Slip steps are just about the only steps in ice dance that are not done on an actual edge known as a flat. You'll see these steps in the Paso Doble, the Silver Samba, and the Cha Cha Congelado. These steps are skated flat with both feet on the ice alternating which foot is in front. These slip steps are marked with the letters FF following the foot that is switching from behind to in front or vice versa depending on the direction the skater is skating in. And finally, hops. Hops are used as transition steps, but pretty sparingly. These are used in some of the most recent additions to the compulsory canon, such as the fin step and the tea time foxtrot. Some hops are more subtle than others, with skaters hopping rather than stepping from one edge to the other, while others are clear hops like these ones in the tea time foxtrot. In cases where the hop is assisted by the toe pick, the abbreviation TP is added to the step with either an RF or LF for right and left feet. In the case of unassisted hops, you'll often see the letter H in the abbreviation. Each step has an abbreviation used in both the pattern and the step chart, but each step also has a line which shows the basic shape of the marks left on the ice by the skater's blade. Dots and asterisks are used to note hops typically, with the exception of some light hopping steps like the opening in the fin step, which are noted using dashes because each of these steps begins on the ice when the toes flick up while continuing to travel forward. Now on to some turns. We'll start with the easy and obvious ones. Mohawks, also known as step turns, are the simplest and most intuitive step used to turn from forwards to backwards and vice versa. These are also the first turns we see in patterns. The abbreviation MO is added to the edge abbreviation, but it's not quite that simple. There are two main types of mohawks, and so clarification is needed on the pattern. For many skaters, open mohawks are the intuitive, easier version of the step, where the free leg comes in to meet the heel or the instep of the skating leg. This is abbreviated as OPMO. Closed mohawks, on the other hand, are a little more challenging and sort of bridge the gap between an open mohawk and a Choctaw, which we'll cover later. Closed mohawks have the free leg come in behind the skating leg and are denoted as CLMO. The most memorable closed mohawk is the featured difficult step in the Keats Foxtrot, but they feature prominently in many dances, especially from that level up. Up next are three turns, which have the most obvious and simple notation in patterns. The number three is added to the edge abbreviation of the first edge in the turn. Because this is ice dance, it of course gets a little more complex. But if you can understand what the pattern is trying to tell you, it adds a ton of clarity. Straight threes are only one kind of three turn. There is a second, very similar kind of three turn, sometimes known as American threes, for their prominence in the compulsory pattern, the American waltz. 
Their technical name, though, is swing threes, which is where their notation SW3 comes from. The difference between these turns essentially comes down to the variation in free leg position. With straight threes, the foot of the free leg should connect with the ankle of the skating leg, but whether done correctly or not comes in close to the skating leg. Swing threes, on the other hand, require a little more control because the free leg stays extended throughout the turn and, as the name implies, swings. Because of the number of patterns available to skaters, beginning from a very young age up through senior competition, as well as the versatility of these turns, the vast majority of turns in all compulsory patterns are either three turns or mohawks. However, when it comes to watching and understanding the higher level patterns, it's necessary to know what the more difficult turns will look like when written out. The notations of these more difficult turns, like the others, are fairly intuitive. Rocker is RK, and like three turns, it can be performed as a swing rocker, noted as SWRK. Choctaws, like mohawks, can be open or closed and are noted as CHO, with either OP or CL to note whether it is open or closed. Brackets are perhaps the least common turn in compulsory patterns, but it does appear on occasion and is noted as BR. Finally, the fun one, twizzles. They're noted as TW, followed by a number, which notes the number of rotations to be completed in the twizzle. Most commonly, the number is either one or one and a half. There are a few other abbreviations used in patterns, but they're fairly uncommon, and so they're less necessary for full enough understanding of patterns, so we're going to leave them for now. But why is it written the way it is? While you could perform a pattern with only the abbreviations and notations we've covered, there would be a whole lot of room for interpretation of tempo and ice coverage. And the step charts do exist and they do provide a ton of information, but there is a reason why the general shape of the pattern is drawn out for you. Each line on the pattern shows approximately the length and shape of the edge relative to the ice surface included on the pattern, which is why both midlines are defined. This makes it easier for skaters to be sure they remain as close as possible to the desired shape of the pattern. This being said, as I mentioned, step charts do exist and are used in conjunction with patterns to compare partner steps and to prescribe holds and when changes of holds should occur. There is, of course, also a designated start point, which is why each step is numbered. These are the numbers formatted with a dot after them to distinguish between the numbers assigned to each step and the second number. This second number attached to a step is typically on the other side of the line marking the step, and it indicates the number of beats allotted for that step. That, combined with the music and tempo assigned to the pattern, tells the skater just how fast or slow to skate each step. But some steps have more than one number assigned to them. So what does that mean? When a step has timing formatted as a number plus another number, that indicates the number of beats assigned to each part of the step. This is primarily applied to one foot turns, like three turns and rockers, rather than mohawks and choctaws, or changes of edge. And more numbers can be added as more steps and turns are done without putting a foot down. The first number applies to the part of the step or turn before the change whether that change is a turn or a change of edge. In the case of twizzles, despite the way that it is drawn out, the second number applies to the entirety of the turn. In the case of a turn noted as, for example, three plus three, the skater turns on the third beat of the turn, then holds the exiting edge for three beats. You've got most of the basics, but we've got a few last details to cover before you can really put this information to use. First, some patterns will indicate where the judge's stand is. This gives the skater an indication of where they are supposed to begin the pattern to test or compete. In practice, compulsories, outside of a short dance or rhythm dance, are often practiced starting at both ends of the ice, for practical ice sharing reasons. But there is generally a preference or even a requirement for the start of the pattern and that is indicated sometimes on the paper pattern. If you've looked at patterns before, you may have noticed some patterns only have the steps indicated on half of the page. Some patterns, especially the low level ones, but also some of the higher level ones we'll see in competitive ice dance, 
do only cover half the ice surface. While these are shorter, they also typically include steps or turns that are newer or harder than the steps in the longer patterns at the same level. When competed as compulsories or tested, they are also typically required to be performed more times than the longer patterns, so that skaters skate for approximately the same amount of time for all patterns at the same level. You've hopefully also noticed that each pattern I've shown you only shows the marked steps for one partner. For the vast majority of higher level patterns, the man and the lady have their own pattern. If this is not the case, the top of the pattern may say both partners skate the same steps. Otherwise, coaches typically have two paper patterns per dance. One is labeled lady and the other man. The last of our notes is a bit more of a fun fact than anything else. The marked start on each of these patterns is not when skaters typically actually begin skating. They typically skate intro steps, and these are not set by the ISU or governing bodies. Coaches and clubs generally have steps they prefer, but they're not universally the same. This mostly applies to actual compulsories, rather than patterns skated in a short dance or a rhythm dance, since they're integrated into the program in that case. Now, let's put this knowledge to use and take a look at some patterns. Before we dive into the patterns you're likely to see at the competitive level, we're going to break down one of the low-level patterns to get a sense of what everything means before there's too much on the page. I definitely recommend having a copy of the pattern open, ideally a physical one if you can, as these can be a little bit trickier to read on a screen especially a small one. All of the patterns I'll be using today are linked below. We're going to start with the Fiesta Tango, which is often the first dance kids learn with backwards skating and therefore turns. This is a simple pattern, but it will give you the chance to put the information to use. Don't worry if this is still a little bit confusing. Especially if you're new to this, you may need to review the information in the first section of this video before you really feel confident putting it to use. But let's take a look at the paper pattern for the Fiesta Tango. We're about to watch how it's actually skated, and then we'll talk about the transition from paper to ice and back again. This is a case where the pattern only covers half the ice, so two rounds of this pattern form one lap of the ice. Some of the key steps you should hopefully be able to identify are the cross step six, the change of edge, step eight, and the open mohawk, step 10. For beginning ice dancers, these are the steps most difficult to execute with a partner. If you're looking closely at these skater's blades, you should hopefully be able to see just how each of these steps is executed on the ice and how that looks similar to the tracing on the paper pattern. Hopefully you can see how a basic pattern transitions to the ice, but you're not likely to see this at competitions unless you're watching pre-juvenile ice dance. Before we dive into the fin step, there is one crucial piece of knowledge you'll need to fully appreciate ice dance scoring. What is a key point? If you listen to the podcast with any kind of regularity, you've definitely heard us complain about key points, the choice of which steps are key points, and the fact that dancers aren't evaluated on every step of the pattern. Before we move on to the fin step, let's talk about what exactly key points are to avoid any confusion. Key points are steps chosen by the ISU for junior and senior competitors in the rhythm dance. These steps are the steps the ISU has decided are the most important in the pattern, at least in theory. They're often some of the most difficult steps, whether they have the most difficult turns, the most complex timing, or both. Either four or eight of these small sets of steps are selected and cover both the man and the lady equally. Unfortunately, this means, especially on longer patterns, much of the pattern isn't truly evaluated. Skaters can't completely flub through the pattern, but if their timing is slightly off, they skate the wrong edges or hop turns, it doesn't impact the base value of the pattern, unless it falls within those select groups of steps. For this iteration of the fin step, which only covers half the pattern, there are four key points two for the man and two for the lady. We'll talk a little more about these as we move on and talk about the fin step. Next, let's take a look at the 2019-2020 and 2020-2021 senior pattern, the fin step. We're gonna start by looking at just the ladies pattern. If you've never looked closely at a paper pattern, there's a good chance this just looks like gibberish right now, but that's okay. Even skaters can struggle to connect the pattern to the steps they actually skate, but I promise it is the same set of steps. This is a lot more complicated than the Fiesta, but the same basic principles apply. These first 10 steps of the pattern 
don't look the way I described early on. Newer patterns break more of the ice dance conventions we talk about, so this fairly new pattern breaks two main rules. This is definitely the bigger of the two unconventional sections of the pattern, hinging on the fact that these opening steps are flat. This means that there isn't actually an edge assigned to these steps. For ice dancers, this can actually be more difficult in many ways than skating on an edge. We're trained to dig deep into those edges, to sink into them, to make them as deep as possible. Skating flat can actually be pretty hard. Plus, we add the additional difficulty of the hallmark toe flicks on steps seven, eight, and nine. With a quick glance at the pattern, I bet you can identify which steps make up these toe flicks because the lines for each step are half filled and half dashes. These dashes mark unassisted hops, meaning they don't use toe picks to gain height. Step 10 is the first step with an assigned edge in this pattern. This also marks the beginning of an easily identifiable step, the progressive leading into the first twizzle of the pattern. You'll notice the last step in the progressive is the same step as the twizzle. The lady does not initiate the turn immediately on that step. There is a half beat in this step assigned as a left forward outside edge, which is the end of the progressive, before the half beat assigned to the twizzle. You'll notice another dash on step 15, where the skater's toes flick up again. This is where we move into the 2019-2020 season's key points. For the lady, this covers steps 20 and 21 of the fin step. These steps constitute only the cross behind, XB, the cross in front, XF, and the right back inside twizzle. This means the bracket in the previous step is not a key point though it is arguably more difficult and adds more variance to the required steps in the key points, but I digress. Steps 22 through 31 are primarily progressives, though the speed they're done at and the addition of the toe pick hops add both variance and difficulty to this section. Then we get into the next key point. Steps 32 and 33 feature certainly some of the more difficult elements of the fin step at least in the first half. This is also where the timing gets a little more complicated. Hopefully, you've noticed that up to this point, each step gets either one beat or half of a beat. While the added time here makes some of these steps a little bit easier, it's also harder to flub through slower steps. And with more time, balance can become even more crucial, especially as we move into step number 33. Step 32 is the swing closed Choctaw. This is a step we haven't talked about specifically up to this point, but it's made up of steps we've already covered so hopefully it's starting to click just a little bit. Unlike swing threes, the turn itself isn't so much different as the setup. This turn begins with a swing roll, one of those crucial early steps we talked about, followed by a closed Choctaw. This is a pretty common entry to Choctaws, so it doesn't particularly add to the difficulty of this section. Step 33 can be considered one of the most difficult steps in this pattern. There are two main parts of this step. The first being a change of edge from a right back inside to a right back outside. This change of edge gets a total of three beats, two for the inside edge and one for the outside. Without a change of foot, this is followed by a twizzle, and then the sliding stop, which is perhaps the biggest hallmark of this pattern. The twizzle only gets one beat of music for a one and a half revolution twizzle, while the slide gets two beats. The edges here are critical, and any additional changes of edge or unclear edge throughout will result in an N for this key point. Because we unfortunately only get to watch half this pattern in the current rhythm dance, I won't be breaking down the second half of the pattern, but this could be a great opportunity to test your own knowledge and see if you can identify the steps in the second half and start to picture what they look like on the ice. This could also be a great opportunity to go back and look at those 2013-2014 short dances featuring the fin step in its entirety. Before we move on to the man's pattern, this pattern features an oddity that we personally know and love, and I think it needs some clarity. This box? might just look familiar to you. This is how the ISU communicates the set topic dance we love so much. But at a glance, it can certainly look like gibberish. The fortunate thing for you though, is that these steps should mostly look familiar. It's a combination of topic hops, crosses, and a few steps, with the vast majority of the steps getting only half a beat of music. This set of steps is the same for both the lady and the man. And while we don't get to see it this season, it certainly was a fun addition the last time we saw it, back in 2013-2014. Now onto the man's pattern. 
you'll notice that the opening 11 steps are the same for the man as the lady, right up until her very first twizzle. The time for which is filled by a chasse progressive for him. Hopefully this is a step you recognize from our earlier bank of many, many steps. The steps outside of this season's key points and the key points used in the past are largely either the same or mirrored for the man and the lady. The man's first key point again begins with step 20 and features a left forward inside cross behind followed by a twizzle, which coincides with the ladies but it's slightly different. He does only one revolution on his twizzle compared to her one and a half because he begins step 21 with a swing three, then without putting a foot down, completes the twizzle. We haven't talked much about how the two patterns interact with each other, but the steps are combined with a designated hold or transition through holds, which are laid out in the step charts. We are not going to get into step charts today, but they mostly feature the step number, the step abbreviation, and the hold, but they cover both skaters skating the pattern. In cases like this, the biggest difficulty for both partners can be perfection on the turns to allow them to seamlessly catch each other's hands on the end of their twizzles. Like the lady, the steps between the two key points are relatively simple in the grand scheme of ice dance and lead into complementary steps for the final key point for the season, which, to be fair, are fairly different. The man's steps 32 and 33 are more divided than the ladies, since there is an actual change of foot inside step 33, unlike for the lady. Key point four, the man's second key point begins with the swing close Choctaw, but is followed immediately by an open Mohawk before he completes the twizzle into the sliding stop. The timing for the man is similar, but slightly different to the ladies. And once again, he only does a single twizzle compared to the ladies one and a half. Again, the steps for the toe pick dance for the man are included in a box in the bottom corner of the pattern. These steps are the same for both skaters. Hopefully the combination of information, I threw a lot at you, examples and direct comparison between the paper pattern and the way it is skated has been helpful for you. If it doesn't really make sense yet, don't worry. Give it a day or two and come back to give it another go. If you're feeling pretty good about the information I've given you, or even if you're not, I would challenge you to pull up another pattern, maybe one you're less familiar with, like the Tea Time Foxtrot, and give decoding it a try. You might be surprised by what you've learned, but it might also be trickier than you expect. Like any skill, it takes patience and practice to learn how to read a pattern, but hopefully this, the ISU's description of the key points, often given with very little context, makes a little bit more sense now. I hope you've enjoyed this deep dive into a little sliver of ice dance, and I hope to be back with some more ice dance explainers for you guys. Leave us a comment and let us know what you'd like to learn next. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll be listening to Flutzes and Waxels, a figure skating podcast wherever you listen to podcasts.